The formation, growth, and development of bones are discussed in the screencast. This information is found in Chapter 6 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the functions of osteoblasts, osteocytes, osteoclasts, and chondroblasts. Define ossification. Summarize the formation of the fetal skeleton. Describe the process of long bone growth. Describe the process of bone remodeling. And list the factors that affect bone health. The formation, growth, and development of bones involves the activities of four types of cells. Osteoblasts are responsible for building new bone. Osteocytes are responsible for caring for bone after it has been built by the osteoblasts. Osteoclasts break down existing bone. And finally, chondroblasts are responsible for building new cartilage. I would like to now present the development of the fetal skeleton. Now your book goes into great detail as to how this process occurs. I am not going to go into the level of detail as described in your book, nor will I require you to know that level of detail. So the human skeleton first appears at about six weeks of gestation. So in the embryo, approximately six weeks after fertilization. And the long bones of the skeleton, and we're talking exclusively about the long bones, are composed exclusively of cartilage. Cartilage that has been formed by chondroblasts, cartilage forming cells. That cartilage is replaced over time by bone that is produced by the osteoblast. The osteoblasts basically lay down the organic component of bone, the collagen fibers, and then those collagen fibers are uh, calcified as calcium phosphate crystals form on and around the collagen fibers. So slowly the cartilage is being replaced by bone. The chondroblasts lay down new cartilage. Old cartilage continues to be replaced by new bone formed by the osteoblasts. And those two processes produce the lengthening of the long bone. So in the fetus, we have longer bones and a greater percentage of those bones are composed of actual osseous tissue. As new cartilage is laid down and old cartilage is replaced by bone at a greater rate, eventually by the time of birth, almost all of the cartilage has been replaced by bone. Save two areas of the long bone, we still have some cartilage surrounding the epiphysis which is known as articular cartilage. And we also have a small amount of cartilage in an area lying between the epiphysis and the diaphysis called the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is sometimes referred to as the growth plate. It is where the bone is actively lengthening and the bone will actively lengthen at the epiphyseal plate until the end of puberty, where long bone growth stops. This is the figure from your book that shows the same process that I just described, the development of the long bones of the fetal skeleton. Again, I am not going to require you to know this process uh, to the level of detail that is described in your book. I basically want you to remember that the fetal skeleton starts off, uh, the long bones of the fetal skeleton initially is composed exclusively as, of cartilage produced by chondroblasts. Osteoblasts begin to replace the cartilage with new bone. 
the chondroblasts continue to lay down new cartilage, and as the old cartilage is converted to new bone, the long bones lengthen. The conversion of or replacement of cartilage with osseous or bone tissue exceeds the formation of new cartilage such that at the time of birth, the long bones are composed almost completely of osseous tissue except for the articular cartilage and the cartilage of the epiphyseal plate. And the epiphyseal plate is the site of active bone lengthening, which will continue up into adulthood uh, where long bone lengthening ceases. After birth, long bones continue to grow on into adolescence and early adulthood. Long bones grow in both length, and that process is referred to as longitudinal growth, and they also grow in width, and that process is referred to as appositional growth. Let's look at both longitudinal growth and appositional growth. Long bone growth is illustrated in this figure of your textbook. Longitudinal growth, which is the lengthening of long bones, occurs at the epiphyseal plate. Here, chondroblasts are actively dividing to form new cartilage here, while older cartilage is being replaced by bone tissue due to the activity of the osteoblasts. As long as new cartilage is being formed, the bone will continue to lengthen. Long bones also grow in width. This is called appositional growth, and this occurs at the diaphysis. Here, osteoblasts found in the periosteum form new bone tissue. This causes the compact bone to thicken in the diaphysis. At the same time, osteoclasts, those are the bone dissolving cells, which, are, which line the medullary cavity, dissolve bone to cause an enlargement in the medullary cavity. So with appositional growth or a widening of the bone, not only do you get an increase in the thickness of the compact bone, due to the osteoclasts, you also get a widening or enlargement of the medullary cavity as the osteoclasts dissolve bone from the inner lining of the diaphysis or medullary cavity. Long bone growth typically ceases somewhere between 17 and 21 years of age, later in males generally than females. During the process of bone growth, osteoblasts, which are responsible for producing the organic portion of bone, the collagen fibers, which then becomes calcified by calcium phosphate crystals, many osteoblasts find themselves completely surrounded by the matrix of bone. And at that point, they become osteo sites. Osteocytes are not involved in the production of new bone, but instead maintaining and caring for existing bone. However, osteocytes could be converted back into osteoblasts if there were a fracture or damage to the bone in the general area of existing osteocytes. If you ever wondered why there is such a rapid increase in height that accompanies puberty, this has to do with the increase in the release of sex hormones and also the increase in the release of growth hormone that occurs during puberty. Sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, prolong the lifespan of osteoblasts while at the same time inhibiting osteoclasts activity. So there is an increase in bone deposition and a decrease in bone resorption. At the same time, 
there is an increase in the release of growth hormone, and growth hormone stimulates the activity of both chondroblasts and osteoblasts. As you know, bone lengthens at the epiphyseal plate due to the production of new cartilage by the chondroblasts, and old cartilage is eventually converted to bone by the osteoblasts. This process is increased in rate as growth hormone levels in the blood rise during puberty. Even after bone growth ceases, the skeleton continues to remodel itself. Osteoblasts continue to produce new bone and osteoclasts continue to dissolve old bone. So over time there is this continual replacement of old bone by new bone. This allows the skeletal system to respond to changes in physical stresses placed on them. Uh, say, for example, you started a new exercise routine, you started biking, or you started running, or you started swimming, or you put on weight, or you began to lift weights and certain muscles began to get larger. This process of remodeling as the skeletal system responds to stresses placed on them allows your skeletal system to adapt to changes in physical activity or changes uh, in the body in general. It's estimated that about 5% of bone mass is remodeled every year. If there is unusual stress placed on the body, it can cause bones to become deformed. And it's also very important that there is a balance between the production of new bone by osteoblasts and the dissolving of old bone by osteoclasts, or the result can be bone disease. As bone is remodeled, there is a cycling of calcium and phosphorus and other components of bone between the bone tissue and the blood. As osteoclasts break down and dissolve bone by the process of resorption, calcium and phosphorus are released into the blood. As osteoblasts deposit new bone, calcium and phosphorus is moved from the blood and incorporated into the new bone tissue. There are multiple factors that can affect both the growth of bone and the overall health of bone. And they have these effects due to their impacts on bone deposition and or bone resorption. The skeleton responds to physical stresses placed on it. The absence of physical stress can actually cause the bones to become thin and brittle. This often happens to, or used to happen to astronauts, uh, when they went into space and their bones were no longer exposed to gravity, or at least not much uh, gravity. Now, various exercises are typically performed by astronauts while they're in space, minimizing bone loss. Certain vitamins and minerals are also important to the proper deposition of bone. Certain vitamins are required for the production of collagen fibers by the osteoblasts. Uh, other vitamins are very important for the absorption of calcium from the digestive tract and the elevation that's necessary of calcium in the blood. Calcium and phosphorus are minerals and it's very important that sufficient amounts are consumed in our diet in order to make them available for bone deposition. The process of bone deposition and bone resorption is controlled by several hormones and we'll talk in detail about that in an upcoming screencast. And age also affects 
bone growth and health as we age, at least as we uh, pass middle age, bone deposition tends to decrease and bone resorption tends to outpace bone deposition. In summary, this screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the functions of osteoblasts, osteocytes, osteoclasts, and chondroblasts. Define ossification. Summarize the formation of the fetal skeleton. Describe the process of long bone growth. Describe the process of bone remodeling. And lastly, list the factors that affect bone health. The next screencast discusses the repair of a fracture and calcium homeostasis.